Covalent bonding, part five. Bond polarity versus molecular polarity, three-dimensional molecular structure and symmetry, and the VSEPR model. Bond polarity is when electrons are shared unequally across a polar covalent bond. When that happens, we would say there is a dipole moment that exists across the bond. And what that means is that there would be a slightly positive side of the bond, indicated with a delta plus, or a positive dipole, and a slightly negative side to the other side of the bond, indicated by a delta minus, or a negative dipole. Now this is when we have uneven distribution of electrons across the bond. Molecular polarity, on the other hand, is when we have uneven distribution of electrons across the entire molecule. Then we would have a dipole moment that exists across the molecule. Now generally we can say that there are two criteria that are needed for this to happen, for us to have molecular polarity. The bonds in the molecule have to be polar, and the structure of the atoms in the molecule has to be asymmetrical. So what does that mean to have symmetry? Well, we don't have to get too complex about it. Let's say that we have a three-dimensional molecular structure and we build an imaginary cube around it. If there's a balance to the structure between the left and the right and the top and the bottom and the front and the back, then that would be considered a symmetrical molecule. That would be symmetrical in all directions about the origin, about the very center. Now we can look at a few basic shapes and understand that molecules that are really complex are really just built of uh, some basic shapes of smaller molecules. And we can understand which of these or uh, some samples of these that are symmetrical. If you have two identical atoms bonded together, of course, that would be a symmetrical structure. If you have three atoms where a central atom is bonded to two identical atoms, that would be called three atom linear, and that would be a symmetrical structure. If you have four atoms where the center atom is bonded to three identical atoms on the outside, that's called trigonal planar, and that's also a symmetrical structure. Now you might say, well, that doesn't seem to be symmetrical. The bottom seems to have more atoms than the top does. But consider that the distribution of atoms would balance out. Now, one way to, to make that uh, easy to, to uh, understand is, let's say that we have a tug of war where we have three ropes all attached in the center, and three people are pulling on a rope, and they're pulling each on that rope with even force. The center of the ropes wouldn't move. Now that can happen in three dimensions as well. If we have one, two, three, four, five different atoms bonded, a central atom bonded to four identical atoms along that kind of a structure, where this triangular bond indicates that it's coming out of the page a little at us, and that dash bond, made of hash marks there, that's indicating that the bond's going into the page a little bit away from us. That's called a tetrahedral structure, and that would also be symmetrical. If you were to make a pyramid with four sides on it, in Greek, we would call that a tetrahedron. So this is a tetrahedral structure. Now, for these to be symmetrical, again, the outside atoms would, would all have to be the same. And there can be uh, you know, a few more uh, symmetrical structures out there, but these are the symmetrical uh, structures that we run into most of all. Now it turns out that 3D molecular structure for simple molecules can be best understood using examples of molecules with central atoms from the representative elements. So we can examine these basic structures with these examples. So representative elements would be elements from group 1 and 2 as well as elements from groups 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Group 18, noble gases, haven't been included because they uh, rarely do bonding. The symmetrical structures are indicated with the blue outline. So first of all, we have chemical formulas. Sodium from group one bonded to one hydrogen, and I have all of these bonded to hydrogen because hydrogen doesn't have any 
non-bonding electron pairs, so it's easy to draw structures. Magnesium bonded to two hydrogens. Magnesium's from group two. Aluminum bonded to three hydrogens. Aluminum's from group 13. Then silicon bonded to four hydrogens from group 14. Phosphorus bonded to three hydrogens. Phosphorus is from group 15. Two hydrogens bonded to sulfur. Sulfur's from group 16. And a hydrogen bonded to a bromine. Bromine's from group 17. The two-dimensional structural formulas, or Lewis structures, are something that we've done already. So we could come up with these Lewis structures by writing down the electron dot structures for the atoms and connecting the dots. And then what you should notice here is that the three-dimensional shapes for these molecules is different than the two-dimensional shapes. Notice that what we're trying to do here is because electrons are negative, negative repels negative, right? That's the law of electrostatics, or part of the law of electrostatics, likes repel. Electrons are going to be moved as far apart as possible in three dimensions, not just in two dimensions. So consider this structure. In two dimensions, it looks like the bond angles here would be 90 degrees. The bond angle is the angle between the bonds. But that's not actually what happens in three dimensions. We get bigger than 90 degree angles in three dimensions. So let's take a look at a model of that tetrahedral structure. This is a model of a tetrahedral structure. You'd call this a ball and stick model. So notice that it's symmetrical in every direction. And this, if I put these two bonds in the plane of the paper, then this bond is coming out at us and that bond is, this bond is going back away from us. So this would be represented with the triangle, and this would be represented with the dashed line. We're going to take a look at these different three-dimensional structures for representative elements at the center of the molecules. We call this one two-atom linear, this one is three-atom linear, this one is trigonal planar, we have tetrahedral, this one is called pyramidal, bent, and two-atom linear. Now notice we have two-atom linear in two different spots here. This bromine has three pairs of non-bonding electrons, where the sodium doesn't have any pairs of non-bonding electrons. So they're slightly different in that aspect. So we can say this, kind of make these general categories based on bond polarity, molecular symmetry, we can combine those two things and determine molecular polarity. So if we have polar bonds and an asymmetrical molecule, in other words, an unbalanced shape to the molecule, we're going to get a polar molecule. If we have polar bonds and a symmetrical molecule, in other words, a balanced shape, then even though the electrons are distributed unevenly across the bonds, the uneven distribution will balance out because of the balanced structure and we'll get a nonpolar molecule. Imagine that we have a tetrahedral structure like this. Actually, we can stick with something even easier. Let's say we have a two atom linear structure like this. And let's say that the central atom is a little bit delta minus, it's a little bit negative, and the outside atoms are delta plus. So we would have polar bonds on a molecule like this. But we can't say that this side would be more positive than that side or that the top would be more positive than the bottom or the back more positive than the front. So because of the balanced structure, even if it has polar bonds, it would be a nonpolar molecule. So remember that this is one of the symmetrical molecules that we considered. Another symmetrical molecule would be this trigonal planar shape where we have the central atom bonded to three atoms in the, in the same plane, so planar, and we have that 120 degree angle there. And the third symmetrical shape we considered was this tetrahedral shape. All right, so gotta be careful with my, uh, with my models there, I only made a Play-Doh. So, uh, if we have polar bonds and symmetrical molecules, we get a nonpolar molecule. And if we have nonpolar bonds, no matter what the symmetry is, we typically get a nonpolar molecule. 
Now there are a few exceptions to this. Sometimes, pretty rarely, you can have an asymmetrical molecule with nonpolar bonds, and that can be a polar molecule. An example would be the ozone molecule, but those are pretty rare. We can pretty much stick with the idea that if we have uh, a symmetrical structure, it'll be nonpolar. So let's consider uh, elements from different groups forming uh, molecules. Let's say we have a group one element, sodium, bonded to a hydrogen, so that we have this structure in two dimensions. And really, it'd be the same structure in three dimensions. We'd call that a two-atom linear molecule. In three, that's our three-dimensional shape to it. Now, there would be polar bonds here. Hydrogen would be a little bit more electronegative, so it'd get a delta minus. Sodium would be delta plus as a result. And then to show the polarity of the molecule, because we've used delta charges for the bond polarity, we use a different notation. What we would do is draw an arrow across the molecule, pointing to the negative side, and then put a plus sign on the tail of that arrow. And that would represent the polarity of the molecule. So we would say that this would be a polar molecule indicated by that arrow that goes across with that plus sign. That would indicate the dipole moment of the molecule, or the uneven distribution of electrons in that molecule. Let's take a look at a group two uh, element, or a group two element that's forming a compound. Let's say we have magnesium at the center of the molecule. Let's say it's bonded to some iodines. In two dimensions, we would draw a structure like this. In three dimensions, pretty much the same structure. The electrons are as far apart as they can get in two dimensions or in three dimensions if we draw it that way. This is called three atom linear. Now, the iodine would be delta minus, and the magnesium would be delta plus. So we would have bond polarity. We would have polar bonds. Iodine's a little bit more electronegative than magnesium. But because that's a, a symmetrical molecule, there's a balanced shape to it, right? We can't say that the left is more negative than the right, or the bottom is more negative than the top, or the front than the back. That's symmetrical. It's a nonpolar molecule. So even though within the molecule, across these bonds, there's uneven distribution of electrons, across the entire molecule, that uneven distribution balances out. So it's a nonpolar molecule. Let's take a look at a group 13 element at the center of a molecule. Aluminum is from group 13. Let's say it's bonded to three iodines. So uh, we would have polar bonds here. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the aluminum would be delta plus, and the iodines would be delta minus. But that would also be a symmetrical molecule, so it would be a nonpolar molecule. If we take a look at a group 14 element, carbon making a molecule, so it's at the center of the molecule. Let's say it's bonded to four chlorines. So CCL4 in two dimensions would have this structure. This would be called the Lewis structure or the two-dimensional structural formula. In three dimensions, we draw it this way. And that would be a tetrahedral structure. Now, you really uh, wouldn't be expected to be able to make drawings like this without first taking some ball and stick models and going into the lab and building these and then drawing them when you have them in your hand. So that's two atom linear. That's trigonal planar. Well, I'm sorry. This one was three atom linear. This is two atom linear. And we can also have two atom linear with some electrons on it. We'll take a look at that in a bit. And we looked at tetrahedral already a few times. This is how you would draw a tetrahedral shape. So you can imagine, see if I can get this Play-Doh to stick together. We have a bond in the plane represented with that bond, a bond in the plane here represented with that. My toothpicks are kind of sticking together there. And then we'd have this bond coming out at us slightly angling down, represented by that triangle. And then this bond back here, angling down and going into the plane of the paper. So that's how you would draw that. Now, because that's a symmetrical molecule, even though it has polar bonds, 
the electronegativity of chlorine is bigger than carbon, so the chlorines would all be delta minus, and the carbon would be delta plus. We would say that there's non, it's a nonpolar covalent molecule, even though it has polar covalent bonds. All right, let's take a look at an element from group 15 that's at the center of a molecule. Let's do PBr3. So the phosphorus would bond to three bromines in two dimensions. This way, again, that's a Lewis structure or a 2D structural formula. In three dimensions, it would look like this. Hey, this kind of looks like tetrahedral, doesn't it? But what's missing? That bond to an atom at the top. What we have instead of an atom bonded at the top of this molecule is a pair of non-bonding electrons. And I have that represented by that toothpick sticking out there. So we put one bond in the plane, represented by that. Then there's a bond that comes out at us. That's represented by that triangle. And then one bond that goes away from us. And that's represented by that dashed line. So that's called a pyramidal molecule. And some people would refer to that as trigonal pyramidal. Now, there would be polar bonds on this molecule. The P would be delta plus, and the BRs would be delta minus. And since that's an asymmetrical molecule, if we put a box around that, we could say that the top of the molecule is slightly positive and the bottom slightly negative. We can draw a dipole moment across that molecule. Right, we would put a arrow pointing to the negative side of the molecule with a positive on the positive side of the molecule on the tail of that arrow. That would indicate a polar molecule. So we're going to show molecular polarity here with those arrows and bond polarity using delta charges. If we take a look at a group 16 element making uh, a molecule or being at the center of the molecule, sulfur from group 16, we're just going to have it bonded to two hydrogens. In two dimensions, it looks like this. In three dimensions, it looks like this. Notice these non-bonding electrons that are on the sulfur actually take up some space. You might say that looks like a three-atom uh, uh, three linear molecule in two dimensions, but actually it's called a bent molecule. And this is why the two electrons or rather the two electron pairs, are going to take up space within three dimensions. Kind of looks like a tetrahedral structure missing two of the atoms, right? And, and, and really it is. So we have polar bonds. The sulfur would be delta minus, and the hydrogens would be delta plus, if I'm not mistaken. And we'd have an asymmetrical molecule because we could say that the top of the molecule is slightly negative and the bottom of the molecule is slightly positive. So what we can do is draw our arrow across that molecule, pointing to the negative part of the molecule and putting a tail on the arrow at the positive part of the molecule. So the delta charges indicate the bond polarity and the arrow with the plus sign on the tail indicates the molecular polarity. So we have polar covalent bonds, and a polar covalent molecule here because of the asymmetry. And then finally, group 17 elements like chlorine would form a single bond like with HCl. In two dimensions and in three dimensions, it would pretty much be drawn the same way. And this would be a two atom linear molecule again. Now, the difference between that two atom linear that we looked at before and this one is that here we have some non-bonding electrons. And I'm just gonna stick some toothpicks in here to represent those non-bonding electron pairs. So it looks something like this. And this would be a two atom linear molecule where each one of these toothpicks would represent a pair of non-bonding electrons. Now, that has polar bonds. The H would be delta plus and the Cl would be delta minus. And we could draw, because of the asymmetry on that molecule, it's gonna be a polar molecule, we can draw that polarity in across the molecule using that arrow. Again, the arrow points to the negative side of the molecule 
and on the tail of the, in the arrow there's a little plus sign indicating the positive side of the molecule. So we don't have to get too uh, involved with three-dimensional structures other than to understand that you know three-dimensional structures really do exist and they do affect the polarity of molecules. It's not just about bond polarity. So why do molecules have these certain three-dimensional shapes? Well, whenever you ask why, or whenever you answer the question why in science, well, that would be a theory. So our theory for that is the VSEPR, or VSEPR theory. Now, this is a big name for actually an easy idea. Valence shell electron pair repulsion, or VSEPR theory, says that valence shell electrons, or, or in other words, the valence energy level electrons, pairs are going to repel each other. Valence electrons are negatively charged. And we know from the law of electrostatics that like charges repel like charges. So bonding and non-bonding electrons arrange as far apart as possible in a three-dimensional molecular structure. That's it, that's our theory. So the idea that atomic orbitals, uh, S and P electrons occupying atomic orbitals in atoms just kind of goes out the window when a molecule gets formed. When electrons get shared between two nuclei, this theory just says we don't have to worry about atomic orbitals anymore and really doesn't get into, into any more detail. But, you know, there are some other theories out there. How does the three-dimensional dimen molecular geometry fit with the shape of S and P orbitals and atoms? You know, how can you say that you could make a tetrahedral structure like this, for example, if the orbitals on the central atom could be uh, electrons occupying s orbitals or electrons occupying p orbitals. Remember s orbitals in atoms are just spherical orbitals and p orbitals are these dumbbell shaped orbitals on the y, the x, and the z axes. There are three of those orbitals that make up that p sublevel. So how could you come up with this shape if you're starting with that shape for orbitals? Well, Some other theories that are out there, and we're not really going to get too much into these, but I just wanted to make mention of them. Hybridization theory is one, and this is really used very much in organic chemistry. Now, it's somewhat of a limited theory. Relatively recently, we found out that uh, atoms that go beyond period two, so period three elements and larger, don't really follow hybridization theory very well. So this is limited to atoms in the first and second rows on the periodic table, but that includes carbon, and carbon is the focus for organic chemists, so they use hybridization theory a lot. So if you get to organic chemistry, you might talk about this, and basically what it says is that S and P atomic orbitals hybridize or mix together to form hybrid molecular orbitals. And the hybrid molecular orbitals can explain shapes like this. So basically, we mix the S and the P orbitals, or we hybridize them. Now, there's another theory out there. It's called molecular orbital theory. And this says that S and P atomic orbitals combine with each other, but they form what are called bonding molecular orbitals and anti-bonding molecular orbitals. When electrons distribute between two nuclei, they would pull the nuclei together, and that would be a bonding molecular orbital. But it's also likely that when you mix atoms together, the electrons distribute outside of the nuclei. And when they do that, they would pull the nuclei apart, and those would be anti-bonding molecular orbitals. So in molecular orbital theory, we take a look at how you can map out the different molecular orbital possibilities and populate those molecular orbitals with electrons that come from atomic orbitals. Now really, hybridization theory and molecular orbital theory are beyond the scope of a first-year chemistry course. But if you understand what we did in this video, then you should be able to answer these 10 questions. Given these molecules, CH4 with this structure, MgBr2 with this structure, H2O with this structure, Bi3 with this structure, and NBr3 with this structure, and given that they all have polar bonds, for numbers one through five, Answer, what is the three-dimensional shape of each molecule? In other words, what's the name? Two-atom linear, three-atom linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, pyramidal, bent. Tell me 
What is the name of each one of these structures here? Then for six through 10, what is the molecular polarity of each? Now these all have polar bonds, but which of these would be polar and which of these would be nonpolar molecules? Good luck.